folks, I went to church. I had the privilege of going to church, my wife and I, and Brother Glenn, his wife. And we went to an Arab Baptist church in Nazareth wow. Sunday morning. So the missionary, Brother Morales, told me, he said, don't go through the town. I said, I'm going to go down and get a cup of coffee. <laughs> I said, I grew up in D.C. I, man, I, you know. So my wife's saying, you're hard-headed. You're just, you're just, you think nothing's going to happen all the time. <laughs> and um, so I walked down. She goes, go ahead. So I walk down through Nazareth and I find a bunch of young people, Arabs out there. And the whole town is Arab. Jesus Christ grew up in Nazareth. And I walked up and I walked up to a bunch of guys. I said, hey man, I want a cup of coffee. Coffee, coffee. One guy spoke English. He said, yeah, I'll get you coffee. He goes inside and I'm, I'm talking to him, giving out tracts, you know. And, uh, and we go inside and they get me a cup of coffee. And I, then I realize, look around, I'm, I'm in a bar. I'm in this <laughs> I, I, you know, and he's making me call me. I'm witnessing this guy across, and I'm sitting at the bar stool, drinking, you know, my, and witnessing this guy. Sunday morning, and um, and uh, got to witness to him, and and then you know we got to go back to church and and see that, and then they, the pastor there, they give you a, this little cup of coffee, and I mean the coffee is terrible. I'm gonna tell you what, Amen. Amen. I don't like Starbucks, man. I like Dunkin' Donut. There's no Dunkin' Donut, and. There's no Dunkin' Donut in California I, that I could find. I think Starbucks is communism. But, so, or for yuppies. <laughs> no, but I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. But I'm just. Kidding. But anyway, um, we went to Israel, and uh, man, we had a blast. Brother Glenn told me, "So don't you get us killed over here." <laughs> I was going to, I got pictures of Israeli soldiers and while they're talking to me, they got their hand, their weapon, we were in McDonald's. They got their machine guns on their side and they're smiling, got their finger on the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but we had a blast, man. And uh, it was just, and you know, you, um, we were, I was, I thought I was going to get a good steak over there, but man, so I was in old, old town, Jerusalem. And old Jerusalem is full of Arabs. But, you know, I got to sit down and witness to them, man. Uh, they didn't get saved. Yeah. Um, look at Luke chapter 22. And uh, we, like I said, we went to Israel. And, um, and uh, we were just dumbfounded. I mean, here I was, the Bible was coming alive. Everywhere we went. You ride down the road and all the signs are in, in Hebrew, Arabic, and, and uh, English. Just like when Jesus hung on the cross. And we're riding down the road, man, just, and I'm just looking at everything. We pulled up, and at first, I, I didn't know where we were going. We just pulled up, and Brother Glenn said, I said, where we at? Where we at? Where we at? I was like, little kid, where we at? And he said, we're in Caesarea. I said, really? So that's where Paul was. That was the first stop. So we go out to Caesarea, and we get into Amphitheater where Paul stood before King Agrippa and, and Festus and all, and, and he said, Thou, you're mad. You're crazy. I was on the top. I was running around everywhere, just running around. This, and then they, they, have, uh, they have where the chariot fights. You know, you remember Ben-Hur? They, they had that, you know, where the chariots. Man, I tell you what, I was just in awe. My wife and I both was in awe, just looking at everything. And then we got, the next day we went down, um, and, you know, we went, I forget where we went. We went, we went all the way down to um, um, the Dead Sea. Went, one day we went down there, and we drove through the desert, and here you see all these, these Arabs in their, in their uh, tents, and uh, what, they were living out there in the, in the desert, and, and, you know, and they got camels, and then you see a four-wheeler right beside it. <laughs> Man, it was cool. That was cool. And we went down to the Dead Sea and went in there and we went by and I went, you got to be kidding me. There was a lot hotel. <laughs> I said, we ain't staying in there. <laughs> <laughs> lot hotel. <laughs> I, I, and, and then my phone beeped and says, welcome to Jordan. I said, let's go over to Jordan. He goes, no, man, we ain't going over to Jordan. We might not get back. I said, come on, man, be exciting. Let's do it. <laughs> And uh, he said, no, no, we're not going over there. We're not doing that. And um, so anyway, we got back. And, and the day, the highlight was when we went to Jerusalem. Amen. And man, we went into Jerusalem. Yeah. And um, we got looking at old Jerusalem. We walked in. The missionary was showing us. He said, the Jerusalem, Doc wrote in his book, you know, that's the only city ever been fought. Uh, had 48 wars over that city. 
48 or more over that city. He said, look at those bullet holes in the lion gate. That's right. We're, I'm looking at all that stuff. I walked in and we're looking at right in the middle of the, of the uh, uh, area there, there's the menorah. Yeah. Solid gold. They had it open. I tried to put it in my pocket, but it wouldn't go. <laughs> no, they had it open. And I said, can my wife and I get, they were cleaning it. And I said, can we get in there and take a picture? And we got in there, took a picture. So to make a long story short, we went into the five, the institute. They have a five uh, temple institute. And we went through that thing. And there was a guy sitting in there. He was Israeli, young guy, has glasses on, sunglasses. We're in a dark room. And then they light up the whole city the way it used to be. You sit in there as cool as anything. And they, they claim they got everything. We seen uh, the high priest, um, um, the garments. We seen all that stuff. And a guy just texted me just yesterday and said, look at here, man. They're, they're praying on the Temple Mount. I told our church, I said, it's coming. It's coming. Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. It's coming. And so um, this guy was following us around. I was trying to talk to him. I was trying to witness to him. Because I witnessed to a girl on the plane that she was in intelligence, Israeli intelligence. And I, was, I went into revelation with her. She's sitting in between us. She couldn't get between me and my wife. So I'm witness to her, and she shut down after a little while. I was going to Isaiah. I went through Isaiah, all that stuff with her. And then when I got the revelation, man, it shut her down. And I said, if you're in Israeli intelligence, you know stuff. We went to the uh, uh, you know, Megiddo Valley and seen all that. And uh, where Elijah stood on the Mount Carmel where he has his foot on the, and there's a Catholic church right there. Oh. Catholic church, right there. The prophets of Baal, got that statue. Yeah. I went to the bathroom a lot in Israel because I kept passing out, putting tracks in the bathroom stalls. Because <laughs> you have everybody from around the world that goes there. Yes, sir. And, but um, we went into um, old, uh, old Jerusalem and then we went to Calvary. And we got to Calvary Woo! I got to see Calvary. And man, we stood there, and Brother Glenn, I got a video, he's saying, he said, look, the most important event that happened in all the world, yeah. in all world history, and they got a bus stop at the bottom, and nobody even noticed. And then we go over, and we go by a cistern that they found, Back in the 70s, they said that what couldn't have been, that couldn't have been the grave of where Jesus Christ's tomb where he was uh, uh, placed. It couldn't have been because there wasn't no water. But then they found a cistern there. There was water. The Arabs blocked it up. So we go to the, we go to the, uh, into the tomb. It's, you know, it says he is not here, but he is risen. Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah. My wife and I go in there and we get down and Jesus had to be about that, you know, where he laid was about right, that, right there beside us. We was just in awe. And we were coming out of there, and I mean, I, I walked by these, uh, they were either Nigerians or they were from Africa, and man, there was about 30 of them up there, and they were singing, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, but they were singing in their native language. Tears running down their face. And I'm singing in English with them. And they were singing that thing to the top of their lungs and they looked up and I started singing with them and I looked up at them and they were looking down at me and they were weeping and I was weeping. Amen. 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 And man, we, we went in that tomb and we come out of that tomb and as we was going up out of there having like a, a shop that you go through and buy souvenirs and Brother Glenn's wife grabbed him by the arm because Brother Glenn was trying to show us everything. He was trying to, it was in a hurry. And, he, and, and his wife grabbed his arm. She said, Glenn, we got to do something. She's crying. So we go back right by the tomb and there was a place where people could sit. We all, all of us got down on our knees there. Nigeria is singing up there and we're down there weeping and praying and thanking God. I said, Lord, it started in 1974 for me. Come on! The night I got saved. 1974, September uh, 30th. I was running from the police and, a, and, a, and I thought the guy was set me up to kill me. And that night is when I got saved. I didn't know nothing. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I didn't know nothing, man. I went, went to prison. I didn't know nothing. But that day is what started it for me. 1974. Calvary started. Yes, sir. For me. Changed my life. 
Hallelujah. Thank God. Praise his holy name. 1974, Calvary came to me. And boy, I tell you what, we'd come out of there and we were just weeping and shouting. And I was witnessing the Arabs and witnessing the Jews. You're not supposed to, you can get kicked out of the country. But I, I was doing it discreetly, just trying to, trying to just be a witness. I wanted to be a witness for my Lord. Amen. We went up there to Mount of Olives. We were looking at Mount of Olives. We stood next to a tree that was 2,000 years old in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was. I said, man, maybe that tree got started. It's a weird looking tree. It's an ugly looking tree. But it might be the tree where maybe the tears from Jesus' eyes when he wept that night. 2,000 year old tree. Man, what a thing. What a thing. It ought to do so. I tell you what, when I came back, and when I came back from Israel, every time I preached, all I could do was cry. All I did was cry all the time, thinking, man, how good the Lord is to me. I got to see the place. I got to see the place where my Lord was crucified. Take your Bible, look in, in Luke chapter 22. It says, one of the male factors, which was at verse 39, were hanged, railed on him, saying, if thou be the Christ, uh, it says, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But look at verse 27. We'll start there. He says, There followed him a great company of people and of women, which be also bewailed and lamented him. And Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your, your children. Why? He knew what was coming. And brother, it's coming again. It's going to come. Uh, something else is going to come. We, the Antichrist is going to come and all that stuff. All the Jews are suffering that they went through. And uh, it says, Behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed be, blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never, uh, uh, that never bared, and the paps that never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us. We know that's future. Yeah. And to the hills, uh, cover us. And if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? And there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. I wrote down in my Bible years ago, I think Dr. Ruppman might have said it. I don't know who said it, but Jesus went all the way to Calvary to get between two people yeah. and to reconcile two people. Wow. His, he's, he said, there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Hey. He went all the way to Calvary. And the Bible says, for, the, for they do these things in the green tree, then verse 32, and there were also two male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to that place, which is called Calvary, the only King James Bible tells you is Calvary. They, they, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast their lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them bereaved, and saying, uh, bereaved him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. He wouldn't save himself. Why? Because he loved you. He loves me like I was his only child. Never felt so loved before. I can never ask for more. He loves me like I was his only child. God really loves me. Yes, he really loves me. He loves me like I was his only child. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And they part his raiment. And the people stood behind, beholding, and the rulers also with them derived him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, but uh, if he be the Christ and choose uh, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, and coming to him, and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Father, I pray God now you bless the message. Help, help my brothers and sisters, Lord. May they be encouraged tonight. And God, help us to go on with our, Father, with our hearts and our minds uh, and our eyes set on thee. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, thank you for Calvary. Amen. Amen. Years ago, I, my wife and I went out to uh, Ohio. And Brother Drummond said, have you ever been out to the uh, Creation Museum? And I said, no, I never have. And he goes, well, I'm going to take you. So he took us over to the Creation Museum over in Kentucky. And we went over there. I didn't know what I was going to see. Uh, and uh, he goes in. We go in to see the um, Noah's Ark. And we go in and see all this stuff. And I'm walking around looking at everything going, wow. And uh, just checking everything out. Then he takes us in a room. And when he takes us in this room, and I thought, what's this? He goes, you'll see. 
and we go in and we sit down and uh, and uh, one one of them was where you went into the planet like a planetarium. We're looking up at the stars and everything. I got shouting in there. I tell you what, that served me up when I saw that and how big the sun is compared to the uh, the uh, Earth and all that stuff and how you know and all this man just man it just stirred me up. I want to take my grandkids there. And uh, so I'll go in this room and we, this is the last place we go and we sit down like in the theater th seats and all of a sudden you know the person comes out to the uh, stage and starts telling us a little bit about this film and we watched this film and, and it was almost like the guy was right there and he came out it was a Roman soldier walks up and this he's got his helmet in his arm and he comes up and he has a sword on the side and he leans up and he says I was there I was there that day he said I seen never a man spake like this man and he starts describing Calvary he starts describing that thing, man, I'm, we, we're, we're wailing in there. He's describing that thing saying, it changed my life. Never a man like that. Man, I said, we were so tore up and we hurt after him speaking and saying all this stuff. I came out of the room and I stood at the door just looking at everybody's eyes to see if everybody else was crying too. <laughs> I just wanted to see if that touched them like it touched me. My wife and I was crying and I looked at Brother Drummond. He, I said, how many times have you seen this? He said, 15 times. He was crying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you something, you should never get old reading about Calvary. Never get old. But I'm going to tell you something this tonight. I'm going to tell you what we found at Calvary. Man, when we went to Calvary, Jesus Christ, man, paid our sin debt. And I'm going to say this to you tonight. What I found and what you found at Calvary, what we got at Calvary, we got a friend. Amen. Amen. We found a friend. Yeah. Oh, such a friend. He loved me ere I knew him. Amen. Yeah. And he's such a good friend. I'll tell you what, he's such a friend. The Bible says he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I've had some, I had some friends out in the world. I thought they were my friends, but they turned state's evidence against me. And they weren't my friends. I'll tell you what, uh, they, I thought there were some people were my friends, but they weren't my friends at all. I mean, there was guys in the gang with us, and they, we thought, I thought they, they would die for me. Man, they ran first time trouble came. I went by, I went by a neighborhood when I first, when, uh, after I got saved, I went by, uh, before I got saved, I went by a neighborhood of, the, uh, of another gang, and I, I went into a pool hall. A couple of my friends got killed in there. And I said, hey guys, come on man, we're going to a party. I just stole the U-Haul truck. And I said, come on guys. U-Haul, if you're watching this, I didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> but I said, uh, but I said, hey, I'm going to take you all to a party. And man, all the girls you want and all that stuff. And they, all these guys piled them back to this U-Haul. It was a stolen U-Haul. I went down the road through D.C. Man, I was slamming on the brakes, running into things. And you could hear them guys going, pop, 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 pop. They were like pinballs in the back of that truck. And, and then I, what I did, the truck broke. And I left it right in the middle of the road and walked off and left them. <laughs> And the state troopers uh, or the police got them and, uh, and locked them up. I, after I got saved, I went right back to that same pool. They wanted to kill me. I walked back in there and I said, hey, guys, I'm going to a revival. I mean, y'all want to go? <laughs> <laughs> Only one guy took me up on it. Amen. He went to a revival meeting and got saved. Yeah. It was Jack Green preaching. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ, more I tell you what, when he, when he, get, when he saved me, he, get, he became my friend. Yeah. I want to be his friend. Amen. Yeah. Uh, you know, we got friends that say, you know, they're fair, uh, fair weather friends. They'll, come, they'll be there when you got money, like the prodigal son. Uh, he's talking about that prodigal son had friends as long as the money was there. Yeah. And, you know, people got, you know, you say, oh, I've got some good friends. Uh, you'll find out when the trouble comes, right. and when the heartaches come. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know what we found at Calvary? We got a friend, man. I mean, we got a friend that's going to be there to the end. Hallelujah. You know, we ain't got to worry about enduring to the end, but he will endure to the end with us. He's a friend that's sticking close in the brother. What a friend Jesus is. We sing, you know, what a friend is Jesus, and he is. I'm going to tell you something, he's been the best friend. I mean, uh, there's times where nobody didn't tell nobody anything. I've seen God meet our needs. I remember we was coming back from uh, South Carolina, or, or we was coming back from Florida one time. And man, we, uh, my wife and I, uh, we was coming back in this old Rambler. And about South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, we had a flat tire. And the tire blew out. We had two children. We had Samson and we had Ruth. And Ruthie was, uh, had colic, and she was six months old, and she was screaming all the time. And we got we got going, and, and, and me and I, my wife, uh, we did, only had like uh, thirty dollars left to get home to DC with. And we're driving up the road, and I'm praying, said Lord, please have mercy. And we had another flat tire, and we had no spare. 
And about six o'clock in the morning, I'm riding through North Carolina on the side of the road, and I, I'm riding alongside there, and I'm going, oh God, help us, Lord. We ain't got no time. We're trying to get home. And man, it's Sunday morning. We're driving along on this flat tire, and we're driving along and driving along. And finally, I see a house up on a hill, and I said to my wife, stay right here. And Samson wakes up and says, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> and I think, and we had to have gas, and we had to have food. And, I, and then by that time, I think it was down to about uh, 20 bucks. And it was down to about $20. And I, so I go up, and I go up to this, I climb over a fence, and I go to this house, and this lady standing out there waiting for a bus. I mean, she wasn't all there, but she was going to church, hallelujah. <laughs> but she had, a, she had a Santa Claus, uh, i never forget, she had a little Santa Claus that lit up. When I walked up, I went, ma'am, I said, do you live here? And her Santa Claus lit up, and she stood there. <laughs> <laughs> then I realized I wasn't dealing with somebody who had a full deck. And, um, <laughs> And so I said, I, I, went, you, I went somebody home, I went over and knocked on the door. And we had a 68 Rambler. And I mean, what a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah. Um, we have a 68 Rambler, and they were, I mean, you couldn't find a Rambler anywhere. A 68 Rambler. So I, I needed a tire. And I, I told my wife, I said, we got $20. We got, uh, if I can get a tire for $10, we have a miracle. And then we got $10 to get home. So... I went up and knocked on the door and I said, sir, I'm, I'm Alan Ryman. I said, I'm in Bible school, my mother called and, you know, wanted us to come home for Christmas. And I said, I'm not trying to con you. I said, um, I got saved in Washington, D.C. And I started giving my testimony to him a little bit. And I said, I'm trying to get home for Christmas. And he said, what kind of car you got, boy? I said, I got a Rambler, 68 Rambler. I said, I know they, they don't make them no more. They ain't around. I said, but I just, I don't know if you got a wheel. You can, I can get a tire. You can take me somewhere to get one. He said, follow me. So we, we, we walked around. We walked back there to this garage, and he took his little button and opened the door, and there was two 68 Ramblers sitting there. <laughs> he said, I went to the junkyard yesterday and bought two tires. He said, I don't know why. <laughs> They're on the rim. I said, well, I can give you $10. He said, no, just give me five. <laughs> He helped me carry that thing back over, and I witnessed to him, and, you know, and uh, we put the tire on, got going down the road. We stopped at McDonald's. The kids woke up. They were hungry. And, I mean, here we're down to, we're down to like, uh, 15 or no, I forget how much money it was. It wasn't much. I can tell you that. It wasn't much. And we're sitting at McDonald's. And you know how a man is. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, how in the world are we going to make this? How in the world are we going to do it? I told my wife, don't spend no more than $5. No more than $5 at the, good, uh, you know, the McDonald's uh, Happy Meal, whatever it is. <laughs> No more than five dollars. She goes up and she figures out five bucks. And we sitting over there, Samson and my other daughter sitting over there. And we prayed. And this family kept looking at us. I'm, you know how you are when you're kind of, you hadn't slept. <laughs> and you're worried. And I'm thinking, what, what are they looking at? What are they looking over at us for? <laughs> and that, that, they come over. They're getting, ready to go, they're getting ready to go to church. And they come over. They said, where are you all from? I said, we're Pensacola. We're trying to get home. Back, to my, you know, I was, you know, we're Bible students, and the guy goes, "Well, praise the Lord, we're going to church." I said, "Good, good, pray for us." And they laughed. And my wife said, "You see what they did?" I said, "Well, no, I didn't see nothing." She said, "Look under the napkin." Amen, brother. Ten dollars. Amen. Praise God. The Lord said, "You got enough gas now. Get home." What a friend. What a friend. I could tell you story after story after story after story after story after story how God was a good friend. Yeah. Amen. And here's our prayers. Yes, sir. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Take care of every need. I'll tell you something else I found at, at Calvary. I found forgiveness. Yeah. I found a forgiveness. So yeah. Man, we were sitting at the Calvary and we were looking at that thing. There was a couple Arab boys. I'm thinking they were up there on top of, the Mount, uh, on top of Mount Calvary. They were sitting on the wall and they were mocking. And I didn't get mad. I started praying for them. Yeah. I said, here, God, we come to see the place where Jesus Christ died I, and how he paid our sin debt, how we got forgiveness. And I said, them boys could get forgiven. Here they are. They grew up in the place where, man, where Jesus Christ suffered and died. Boy, they could get in, man, that quick. Yeah. But religion won't allow them to have it. Yeah. Man, well, I tell you what, when I got saved, I got forgiven. Yeah. I mean, forgiven from my past, Thank you, Lord. my future, yeah. my yeah. present. Yeah. I forgot right. forgiven. Amen. What I know, I realize is I got I confess my sins daily. There was a thing going around where you don't have to confess your sins. These hyper dispensations going around, and they come in our church. I said, you gotta be stupid to think that. You gotta be. I mean, you gotta be absolutely stupid. I I, I couldn't read and write. My got saved. I mean, I, I was stupid, but I'm gonna tell you that is stupid. 
that stupid. What we found at Calvary was forgiveness. Man, you know, Buddha couldn't forgive you. You know, they never know. I just seen the Pope in, in the uh, Buddhist temple over in Thailand. And I told our church, I said that Daniel chapter uh, 7, I was going through it the other night. You seen that little horn coming up, taking out three horns? I said, you know what? I said, it might not be right. I said, uh, you know, talking about kings and all. I said, but you think about something. I said, think about this. That little horn coming up through the Roman Catholic Church and having control. I said, the uh, Roman Catholic Church got a billion people. I said, Islam's got probably about two billion. And I said, Buddhism. Uh, and I, my, my kids mocked me because I said, Buddhism. <laughs> I said, that's what it is. And um, they said, Dad, you said Buddhism. I said, I didn't mean, I mean Buddhism. I said, if you got those three religions, you got the world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whoa. If you got those three religions, because you got Islam is 20 some countries. Buddhism is uh, at least uh, 10. And then the Catholics got South America and all that. I said, that little horn coming up, the Antichrist. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. And you know what? None of them know that they're forgiven. Yeah. Out of seven and a half billion people on this Come planet. On, out of seven and a half billion people on this planet. And you're sitting here tonight, you know you're forgiven. And you know, you talk to people in religion, they say, well, you say you're going, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? I hope so. Yeah. Have you been forgiven? Well, I hope so. I know I've been forgiven. Amen. I know it without a doubt. Yeah. These things have I written on you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. You may know that you got. I know it. I know I've been forgiven. Well, what a God. Um, when I was over in, in Israel, man, I, like I said, I just wept and cried and thinking about how my Savior went and, man, what he went through. Man, I, and then we was looking at that. We was up on the Mount of Olives, and I got my finger pointing over at the Dome of the Rock. And I, I said, look at there, uh, over at the Eastern Gate. One day, Jesus is going to go right through that Eastern yeah. Gate. Yeah. 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 And I'm coming with him. Yeah. Yeah. You know why? Because I've been forgiven. I'll tell you something else, man. I'll tell you something else I found at Calvary and we found at Calvary together is a fountain. When I was in Bible school in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, there was an old boy who used to get up. They, they, uh, Dr. Seiler had, had a group come in called the Kingsmen or kings or whatever. They were a southern gospel group and they got up there they were singing and they were singing that, that, them songs and, and uh, the whole church is sat there. <laughs> And didn't do nothing. Yeah. I remember sitting there watching that thing. There was about 1,500 folks in this church. And that's where I got a whole old-time religion down in Greenville, South Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. I came from a church that had from 1,500 to 2,500. And uh, the pastor was a good man. Don't get me wrong. I love him. Hey, he, I mean, he would go to court with me every time I had to go to court. <laughs> and he was a timid man, very scared about And I, I had him go with the gang whenever they go, go to jail and stuff. I had him come, and he would go. And the first time I went, he asked me to give a testimony to his church. And, and, if, and when I first started going to church, I sat up the front because I got tired of the teenagers sitting in the back talking. And, my, and I stood up one time and said, shut up! Amen. <laughs> and, I, and I sat on the front row. And I sat with, with and every time he said something good, I shout at him. And he'd, he'd be like, he's a very timid man. And I, and I shout at him, he'd go, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> He said, our, our dear brother is... is Excited. <laughs> they wouldn't let me do anything around the church. I mean, I ran a bus route. I didn't have a license, but I ran a bus route. <laughs> and, and finally, I got somebody with a license to drive, though. I wanted to be legal. And uh, I got my license when I was 14. They took them away when I was 16. And, and uh, I had 68 points on my license for racing and all crazy stuff. But... Um, but I was telling you, when I was at Tabernacle, that group got up and sang. And they had an old boy that was a Marine that got saved. And, and um, he, he, got, he got, you know, he, he got to where he would sing in the church. He couldn't sing a lick. But, and when he sang, everybody got stirred up. I just seen him. I, I've said this story. I don't know how many times. And I just seen him up in uh, Philadelphia a uh, oh, couple months ago. He came up to me. He said, I'm the guy. Wow. I saw him. And he said, you said I couldn't sing. I said, no. <laughs> You still probably can't, but uh, anyway. <laughs> His name was Jerry Rudd. And Jerry Rudd would get up, and Dr. Sutler called on him, and he'd get up, and he'd go, 
There. I, and I'm going to tell you something. I like the way the Southerners do it. Yeah. The way they sing, there is a fountain. Yeah. It's like, there is a fountain. It's not like that. They sing it like this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And he'd get excited. And while he was singing, he would get excited. He'd go, and he'd go, and sin. <laughs> Plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. I tell you what, man. You know what we found at Calvary? We found a fountain filled with blood. You know, I, I heard, you heard this guy, he's out here in California, I guess somewhere, he said, oh, the blood of Jesus Christ has no effect when it comes to your, has no effect when it comes to your salvation. He's nuts. He's crazy. Walk and wash. You know, you know what the Bible says over in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, feed the uh, church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He don't know what he's talking about. He's supposed to be a Bible teacher. I don't want him to teach me anything. I mean, you talking about what we found at Calvary was a fountain. You know what? I can get cleansed anytime. Matter of fact, before I preach, I always go to the bathroom and I get down beside a toilet and I say, Lord, I know I belong in there. But have mercy on me. And use me. That's all of us. He's talking, about, he's talking about that hole pen. <laughs> what I found at Calvary, what we found at Calvary was a fountain. I'll tell you something else about what we found at Calvary. We got a foundation. Man, boy, you're talking about something you can build upon. Now, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know about the um, mansion. You know, some people say the mansion uh, is your body, which possibly could be. Um, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I don't know if, I, but I know I want, a, I want a mansion on Hallelujah Boulevard and Glory, Glory Lane. Amen. Hallelujah Boulevard. Amen. Right. And I, I, I've said this before. You know, if your life is only, you only got 70 years in this life and maybe 80 if you're lucky. Uh, not lucky, but God have mercy on you. Um, I had a lady in our church one time, an accountant. I said, I said, you know, if one year, or one day as a thousand years of the Lord and a thousand years of one day, I said, what would that figure up to be about for a man 70 years? She sat there for a few minutes and she said, preacher, it'd be an hour and 45 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Your life, if you live 70 years to God, there is no time in heaven. Yeah. It's only an hour and 45 minutes. Yes. Wow. I've, got, I've got a lot of friends already died and went to heaven. They only been there a few minutes. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> They've only been there a few minutes. Amen. They're walking around. You know what he said? What are they doing? They're walking around going, whoa. <laughs> Come on, Man, this is something else. Yep. This is wow. We had a guy come to our church that got hit by, by a car in, in Virginia. He was a state trooper. And I'm an ex-convict. I wanted all cops come in preaching one time. So I caught all these cops coming. And, uh, and I, didn't know, I didn't realize that, that we, had, we had a guy, he said, can I spend a day with you? I said, sure, man. He said, can I go to your house? I said, sure. He riding with me. I'm riding through a little town there right by where we live. And uh, I'm riding through the town. And he said, I said, I better slow down and get a ticket. He said, you won't get no ticket. I said, what do you mean I won't get no ticket? He said, he said you won't, as long as I'm with you, you ain't going to get no ticket. I said, well, who do you think you are? <laughs> he pulls out his badge. He said, I'm a U.S. Marshal. <laughs> I said, Really? I said, wow. I said, man, I, I, I don't trust it. I said, you, that might be a fake. I used to sell that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had all these cops come. I had a guy named Buddy Ferris. You can look him up. And Buddy Ferris was the chief of police of uh, Dayton, Virginia. And Buddy Ferris, and he's kind of a little charismatic. He 
but he uh, he was hit by a car right in 1979 and I, I use this at funerals whenever I'm preaching a funeral and I said buddy was hit by a car in 1979 right by King's Dominion on 95 he was uh, doing, uh, taking the guy's uh, place on, it was either Thanksgiving Eve or New Year's Eve or something like that, and he said he pulled this car over in 1979, he had his radar at 83 miles an hour trying to give people a break, and he said he finally his car went by at 90 miles an hour Cadillac, so he pulls the car over, and he says, and you know, that's why you see the cops, all, you know, all these cops getting killed, they park their car so they protect them, and Buddy gets out of his car, walks down, and he said the last thing he remembers is had his hand on the uh, a quarter panel of the car and all of a sudden that's all he remembers he got hit a car came along hit him knocked him over the uh, Cadillac and he said then he uh, then he but he could hear voices but he heard this guy he, he said he was crawling he said I don't know how I did it by crawling and the guy helped me get in his car in the Cadillac and he was gonna try to rush me to the hospital and his wife he said he remembers a woman saying get him out of the car he's bleeding all over the place so they take him out and put him on the side of the bank of the uh, bank there and paramedics come and everything and they pronounced him dead there. He goes to the Virginia uh, Richmond Memorial Hospital. They go in the emergency room. All these state troopers came and, uh, and they, they pronounced him dead there. And they take him and put him on a gurney and all these state troopers are crying, pushing him down to the morgue uh, to the, uh, in the hospital. And they're pushing. He said, as they went down, he said the, he they had a sheet over him. He said the lights were going. He opened his eyes and he looked up. And he said he went, oh, and they, they realized he was still alive. And they took him back to the emergency room. And he said he didn't tell nobody. He didn't tell nobody that, you know, what he, he didn't want to tell nobody what he's seen. His wife came in after he'd been released out of uh, intensive care, put him in a, in a uh, lower unit, brought his Bible to him, and it opened up on his chest to Revelation chapter 4. And verse, uh, I think verse 1. He looks down, it says there's a rainbow that come out of the throne of God. He started crying. He said, what happened was, he said, I walked through this valley. He said, these hands were reaching out, but they couldn't touch me. He said, then I came to the gate. And the gate opened and the rainbow came out. He said, I seen it and then I woke up in the morgue. Wow. He said, I wouldn't tell nobody. He said, the last verse he looked at when he got out of his trooper's car, he said, he was reading his Bible. And he said, the last verse he looked at when he opened, he got out of the car before he went up to the car, he looked at his, in his Bible, it was Romans 8, 28. Wow. For we know all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. <laughs> Buddy Ferris became the chief of police in, uh, in Dayton. He said, a guy robbed the bank there and, and he said they had him surrounded in, a, in an alley. He said, that, he said he went down the alley and he said, he told the guys, he, he, he said, I don't carry a gun. He's Andy Griffith. <laughs> and, uh, he said, I don't carry a gun. So they said, chief, you can't go down there. The guy, got, he's got a gun. He'll kill you. He said, don't worry about it. Wow. He said, I'm not worried about it. He said he walked down there and the guy comes up. He said, I'll shoot you, I'll shoot you. He said, you can't kill me. I've already been dead. <laughs> he said, and the Lord allowed me to come back. Yes, sir. And he starts giving his testimony. That guy, the guy started crying, got down on his knees, got sick. <laughs> Handed him the gun. <laughs> so we had, we had him come. And I tell you what, bless my heart. You talking about, man, a foundation. We got a foundation. Yes. The Bible says if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Amen. I mean, we got a foundation of the Word of God. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I mean, it's not a lie. Yeah, I can go against anybody. I don't care who they are. Amen. Go against anybody. I don't care what they, I mean, they might be smarter than me, but that book's still right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Heaven's still real. Yes, sir. There's still a fountain flowing. Amen. I mean, there's still forgiveness at Calvary. Yes. Jesus said, forgive them. He said, they know not what they do. He's given us a foundation. He told the disciples, he said, man, uh, uh, go out, go ye in all the world, preach the gospel. I mean, brother, he gave them orders. He's given us orders. I mean, you know, as far as I've checked, orders had not changed. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. They've been passed down. Yes, sir. That's we got a foundation. Yeah. That's right. Man, I tell you, we're supposed to stand on it. We're supposed to believe it. I thank God for the King James Bible. Amen. Amen. 
Dr. Rubin helped us with the foundation. He helped us with that. I thank God for that. I'll tell you there's something else we found. I found we found a family. We found a family. You may not want me in your family, but guess what? I'm there. <laughs> You're my brother and my sister. I got me a family now. I got a big family all over the world. Man, when I was in Israel, I, you, know, you know, red, yellow, black, or white, they are precious in the sight. I don't care what nationality you are. If you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you're my family. Amen. And we're going to live together forever, man. Amen. Woo. Right. You, know how, you know how you have some of the family members come over at Christmas time? You say, oh, boy, they're coming. <laughs> oh, man. Come on. And some at Thanksgiving, you say, man, I don't want to argue with them. Yes. We got a family. Yeah. And sometimes our family don't get along. Yeah, that's right. But we, we're still family. Yeah. Thank God. And you know what? I, I've, um, wherever I go, I've, if I run into somebody who's saved, and I say, you saved for sure, you know, they'll tell me, I said, well, they say, I go to such a side, I'm not going to argue with them about doctrine. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah, right. Unless they start with me. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to argue with them. I'll just say, I'll pat them on the back. I said, man, keep serving God. Yeah. Don't you quit. Let me, I, I, let me ask you something. Are you straight on the King James Bible? I mean, uh, I'll tell them. I'll tell them if they ask me. Yeah. I was at, at a job once. I was operating a crane. I was at a job site, and this guy was superintendent. Every time I went in, I got a joy being around this guy. He come in, and I say, uh, I say, hey, man, how you doing? He goes, man, I'm saved. Praise God. And we sit down. He said, man, let's pray together. And we prayed together. And I noticed he had an NIV on his desk. And uh, finally, I prayed. I said, Lord, let me help this guy. Let me do it in a wise way to help him. And uh, so this guy, one day, he says, he's trying to read out the Bible. He's reading something to me. And I said, man, that don't sound right. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, this don't sound right. Look, let me get my Bible. So I got my Bible and I started showing him. And I said, you know, and I started showing him where all the verses change and all that stuff. I said, do you want to know? I said, I said, you say, I said, do you love, first I used this. I said, do you love God? He said, I love the Lord. I said, will you be willing to die for him? He said, yes, sir. I said, does it bother you somebody used his name in vain? He said, sure it does, man. He, I said, was it bother you when somebody changes God's word and tries to say something that ain't there? Yeah. Or put something in there that is? He said, yeah, that would be. I started showing him. He took his, he took his NIV. He says, man, that bothers me. Yeah. Threw it right in the trash. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. But I got a family. Yeah. Can we get a family picture? <laughs> Photo bomb. <laughs> I was up in uh, I was up in uh, Canada preaching and, and I, I said something from the pulpit I shouldn't have said and I, I can't believe that. I, and I didn't mean it I didn't mean it I was trying to tell a story about something and it had a bunch of um, um, Filipinos about fifty Filipinos in there and uh, and I'm gonna tell you something you get a Filipino say they'll make American white American look sick. You get a, a Chinese or a Japanese or a Korean or a Asian saved, they'll make American, white American look sick when it comes to serving God. I was over in Israel. There was Filipinos in church over there. And uh, so, um, what did I tell you that story for anyway? Oh, yeah, I've been Canada. Up in Canada. I was up in Canada and I said, I said, you know, I was talking about this preacher friend of mine. He took his chicken coop and I said, he shoveled all the chicken stuff out. <laughs> and I said the other word. <laughs> and, and the Filipinos started laughing. <laughs> there was one guy, I was there for a revival for a whole week. He never, he never smiled, never laughed, nothing. He just sat there looking at me like this. And this big guy was about six foot nine sitting on the front, on the front pew and he fell over almost off the, off the thing <laughs> and, and it embarrassed me. I said, look, folks, I don't talk like that. I mean, I turned beat red because, I mean, when I got victory over cussing, what a blessing that was. <laughs> when I, first time I hit my thumb, not one bad word came to my mind. That's a victory. <laughs> you hit your thumb lately? <laughs> hit your finger lately? I put a screw right through this finger before I came here. Not one bad word came to my mouth. I ripped that thing out and ripped my finger almost off. So did you go to the hospital? No. 
No. Uh, but anyway, um, what was that guy? What was I telling you about? What was I telling you about? Oh, up there. So I said, I said, folks, I said, look, I'm sorry. I never talk like that. I'm sorry. So I said, I'm gonna back up and we're gonna go again. And I said, and he shoveled that chicken and I said it again. <laughs> By this time, 50 Filipinos was on the floor. <laughs> they were laughing so hard. I turned beet red and I went, and the guy that was sitting there that wouldn't smile, wouldn't do anything, he fell on the floor laughing. <laughs> Man, we got a family. Yeah. And it's the greatest family in all the world. I love you. I, lo I preached a couple of weeks ago, or last Wednesday. I, I, I was stumbling around, but I preached on, you know, um, you know, God loves you, but does he like you? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people I love. I love everybody, but I don't like everybody. <laughs> I'll tell you the last thing. We got a future. We got a future out of this world because of Calvary. Because of Calvary. We got a future. And man, I'll tell you what, I preached hundreds of funerals. Mm -hmm. Hundreds. And a lot of them hurt me. Hurt me bad. We had a young girl in the church. She was like a granddaughter to me. She's 13 years old. And I mean, she grew up in my house. She was only, two, uh, her, mo her, her, her daddy was beating the mama. I've had over 200 people, my wife and I have had live in our house. And this, they end up coming to my house. And he come over, he wanted to do something to him. I said, no, take, you want to take something out? Take it out on me. Come on. I said, but I hit back. Amen. <laughs> she became, when she got, she, wanted, she was looking forward to going to teenage camp. And she, she got to be 13 years old and we had our camp up in Pennsylvania. Samson ran the camp. We did that for about 14, 15 years. And the first, uh, first time she got to go, she was so excited. And I said, all the 13-year-old girls get up here and look what we're going to sing. She was right in the middle. She said this. She said, I know God. I said, give a testimony. She said, I know God saved me. I know I'm going to heaven. I know the Lord showed me. I'm going to be a preacher's wife. And I'm going to serve the Lord all my life. That was in July. Her parents called me. On, and it was in September. Called us Sunday morning and said, Chelsea's on the floor. She can't breathe. They was on vacation. She was 13 years old. And I told, and my wife said, I prayed, but I said, she'll be all right. She'll be all right. Nothing's going to happen to her. They called back and said, she's gone. She had a heart attack. She died. 13 years old. I told our church, I said, I couldn't even talk that Sunday morning. I said, Y'all be here. Her, her grandfather called me up and he said he didn't have the money to go to North Carolina. He came by, got the money so we could help him go down and be with his daughter. I told our church, I said, y'all be here because I know them. They'll be back in church. They're faithful. Faithful. I said, they, he'll go to North Carolina and bring them back and they'll be in church Sunday night. And they were. And I, when they walked in the door, I said, sis, would you like to say something? She got up in the pulpit and said, God been good to me. I know I will see my baby again. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sure. At her funeral, over a thousand people were there. Right. Eighteen got saved. Amen. Amen. And that mama, I told her, I said, you need to go home. We had dinner on the ground. I mean, dinner at the church. I said, you need to go home. She said, no, we were having church tonight, preacher. And I said, no, sister, you need to go rest. You need to go home. She said, no, I'm not. She said, I'm coming to church. So we had church. Church was over. She sat there. All of us sat there to 10.30 that night until she was ready to go. Talking about family, talking about a future. We just sat there. The next Sunday we had the funeral. Like I said, we had 18. The Sunday after that, she's back on her, or Saturday, she's back on her bus route. Running her bus route. And that Sunday morning, after that, she's sitting on the second or third pew, April, the mama. A young lady raised her hand on the front row. And I went down to her. I said, honey, did you raise your hand? She said, yes. To get saved? And she said, yes. April's sitting there. And I said, what's your name, honey? She said, Chelsea. 
I said, your name's Chelsea? And April sitting there, she's like perked up, got her Bible. And I said, how old are you, honey? She said, 13. I looked at April. I said, April, would you like to lead Chelsea to the Lord? She said, I would love to. She got up, led that girl. I never seen that girl again. I'm telling you, man, this stuff is real. I made up my mind a long time ago. I'm not going to serve no dead God. I'm not going to be no dead religion. And what we've got is real. And we've got a future. A lot of religions is just putting on a show. It's just going through a ritual with no future. And when they die, it's like, like gambling with their life. We're set. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What a God. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He get, went to Calvary to get between two people. Yeah. What a God. Amen. Thank God for Calvary. Amen. I'm glad the King James Bible never took Calvary out. Yeah. 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 All the other Bibles have. Amen. Thank God for Calvary. Yeah. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not for me he died at Calvary. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you thankful tonight for Calvary? Yeah. Aren't you thankful for what he's done for us through Calvary? Man, what a God. Man, what a God. What a future we have. You read that book of Revelation? i never forget, I was in prison. And I remember I was trying to read the Bible. I had a new living Bible or whatever it was. I couldn't even read, but I was trying. And I remember a guy come by and looking at, I could still see his face looking in the bar saying, Hey man, what are you reading? I was trying to read the Bible. He said, man, you ever read the book of Revelation? I didn't know that was in there. <laughs> I didn't know what Revelation was. I said, I don't know. So I looked at it and I went, I'm trying to read it. And, I'm, and my wife, like I said, she taught me how to read. And I'm looking at that thing going, and then I was like, I've taught the book of Revelation three, three four times now. Wow. It's real. Yes. All because of Calvary. Yes. Wow. Let's go, Lord, and pray. Father, Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for going all the way, carrying that cross up Calvary's mountain. Lord, we sing about that song, sing Calvary. Lord, what a, what a great song. What a great love that you've showed. Lord, my Father, I pray, my Father, that you'd help us to love you more. As much as you love us, Lord, we could never match your love. But help us to love you. Help us never quit on you. Help us, Lord, you never quit going up Calvary. You never laid that cross down. You never turned your back and said, no, it ain't worth it. God, you went all the way. Help us, Lord, to stay faithful to you. Help us to be appreciative for the grace of God in our lives. Thank you again for Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The altar call is open if the Lord laid upon your heart. The altar call is open if the Lord laid upon your heart. With every head bowed and every eye shut, we like to give you this chance to praise Pray to the Lord, thanking Him for Calvary. <clears throat> He's done so much for you. Amen. It's amazing. No power. It's so amazing. God proved His power time and time again through people who are broken, who need help. Who need God? You're not too, you're not better than God. You need Him. <clears throat> I got a job, I got my future plans, I got my degrees, I graduated, etc. My friend, you're sure missing out. It's so sad. Do you know how much Calvary changed so many people's lives for the past 2,000 years of history? for any nationality and ethnicity, for our preacher who just spoke, for my own life, for Dr. Stevens who just preached, 
for our song leader and the piano player and for the people in this room, scores of people in this room, and the whole world, <laughs> the whole world, would you like to receive Jesus Christ today? You're sure missing out. If you're to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven after you die? You might say, Preacher, I don't know if I can go to heaven after I die. This opportunity is given to you. There might be someone in here who is not saved. You can have that chance today to receive Jesus Christ. I'm going to wrap this up real soon, so if you can just patiently wait a little longer because we're standing in front of Calvary right now. I just, just want to ponder just a little bit here. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? You might say, I don't know, preacher. Today you can get saved. Today you can get saved. You might say, how do I get saved? Three easy steps, that's it. First step, you've got to realize that you can't go to heaven. You might say, really? That's right. You've got to realize that you've sinned against a holy God and the judgment for sin is burning in hell forever. You might say, well, I don't want to burn in hell forever, preacher. Well, that's where step number two comes in, where Jesus is God and He died, buried, and resurrected. Now, you heard that story for a thousand times, but it's so amazing that so many preachers preach endless sermons on it, and you heard our preacher preach on that tonight as well. Do you know why that story is so important? Do you really know why? People heard it, but they don't know. The simple answer is this. Remember step number one? You go to hell because of sin. The only thing that can wash away your sin, and that California preacher is wrong, the only thing that can wash away your sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why He died. You might say, oh, that's why He died, buried, and resurrected. That's why you guys make a big deal about Calvary. Calvary, you're right. Because that's the only ticket that gets you to heaven. You might say, what do I got to do next? Step number three, you just simply go through step one and two to God. You just simply say, God, I realize that because I've sinned against a holy God, I'm going to burn in hell. So, as I repent, I only, I'm, all I can do is just rely, <clears throat> rely on that blood, on that cross to save me. You might say, is that it? Yeah, that's it. It's that simple. You can do it right now and get saved. Now, I know that I'm just probably saying words out of thin air, but there, it might be, there might be a chance for you. And so I would like to give you this chance to get saved. You might say, well, Pastor, I don't know how to say it to God, and I'm so embarrassed well, you don't have to say it out loud. You can say it silently to yourself. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out, preacher? Sure, I can help you out. I'll give you the words on how to say it, and you can repeat after me. But remember this, praying, repeating a prayer cannot save you. It's believing what He did on the cross to save you. I'm just helping you say it. Don't worry. No one knows who you are. I'm not going to point you out. And you can say it silently to yourself. You can say it this way. You can repeat after me in this way. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so His blood can wash away my sin. I only trust what you did on the cross to save me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would bow your head and close your eyes just one last time, please, out of respect for everybody here. If you have received the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, this is including for any of you who went to Calvary, who got saved. So I'm speaking to people who are saved, not to those who are lost. If you are lost and you still do not receive Jesus Christ, don't raise your hand. But if you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and you thank Him for Calvary, could you raise your hand real quick, please? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your honesty. So I'll close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I thank you so much for a great preaching, Lord. We're so indebted to your blood that you shed and for the men that you've blessed to be a blessing in our lives. And I pray that we'll be a blessing to these people. Bless the fellowship in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that He died, buried, and resurrected so that His blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through His blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. But you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common person has no thought of God in their mind. 
that people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting, screaming, and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Whoa! Unto the wicked! I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. getting up there. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, uh, we have not seen such a thing. Brothers and sisters, there's only one hope. Look into that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the man God, our Savior, Jesus Christ.